Well, hello and welcome to another edition of FNR Ask the Expert. Thanks for joining us today. Today, we're gonna to be talking about all things salamanders. You know, we love our hellbenders and we love all the other species too. And today we're gonna to introduce you to all of them. Um, we'll discuss everything from the difference between a salamander and a lizard, which is very important for those of you who don't know. We'll also talk about all the different types of species and also some threats that you need to know about to these amazing amphibians. So today we're joined by Dr. Spencer Courtright. He is an associate professor of biology at IU Northwest. We also have our Dr. Rod Williams, who's uh, in charge of our hellbender um, program here and also a professor of wildlife science and Nick Bergmeier, who's a research biologist and a Purdue Expansion wildlife specialist. So Rod, let's start at the beginning. Let's get the all important question out of the way. How do I know lizard or salamander? Get us started. Uh, that's actually a question that I receive a lot of, you know, what, what, what uh, species of lizard is this? Well, lizards have scales, lizards have claws, uh, and they're reptiles, which are very different than our salamanders, which are amphibians, which are scaleless. They do not have any scales. They do not have any claws, and they're separated by over 100 million years of evolution. So fundamentally, very, very different organisms. And it's always a, a dangerous thing when, when people ask me to, to start a program and talk about amphibians and salamanders in particular, uh, especially if we have any sort of time frame that we have to be considered about because salamanders are my favorite and I could talk about them for hours and hours and hours, but I promise I'm going to keep my segment short so I can defer to my esteemed colleagues. But salamanders are actually really common throughout most of the United States, especially in the eastern United States. But oftentimes they go unseen and unknown by many uh, people that enjoy nature, uh, largely because salamanders are, are cryptic. A lot of times they're, no, they're nocturnal and they like to spend a lot of time under cover objects like rocks and logs and, and leaf litter. So oftentimes you have to actively go search for them in order to find them. But they're a pretty diverse group. There's nearly 400 species of salamanders worldwide. But what's really exciting about the salamander group is that over 70% of all the world salamanders are in the eastern United States and Central America. So especially the Appalachian mountain region holds some of the highest diversity of salamanders on the planet. And Indiana is actually home to quite a few uh, species of salamanders as well. Now in terms of general biology and with regard to amphibians, in my opinion, salamanders have the greatest diversity of form and function. And, and Nick and, and Spencer and I are gonna go through some of these different groups of salamanders and just show you how diverse they are uh, in terms of their biology and their habitat needs. So the first group that we're gonna talk about are, are mole salamanders. And this is in the family Ambystomatidae. And Nick, if you could share your screen, we'll show the, our viewers some pictures of our mole salamanders. So we have eight species of mole salamanders here in Indiana, um, and there's about 30 species found in this family. Now, when you're, when you're looking at these mole salamanders, they have really large, uh, thick, chunky bodies, uh, and these obviously four legs, which is important because not all salamanders do. These are our terrestrial salamanders, at least as adults. And so they have the largest body size of all of our terrestrial salamanders, and they, um, they, they're called mole salamanders because they utilize the burrows of other mammals, particularly small mammals. So they'll use those burrows and again, under those cover objects, rocks and logs and, and leaf litter and debris. Now, what I really like about mole salamanders are their breeding strategies. And that's actually what I spent my, you know, four or five years of my PhD working on was trying to understand the breeding biology of this particular family of salamanders. So they have these annual breeding migrations that typically occur in the warm rainy months during the spring. So depending on where you are in terms of latitude with Indiana, it can happen as early as January, believe it or not, in, in parts of the southern part of the state, or more like mid-March, late March, if you're found in the, in the more northern portions like Spencer and myself are. So they'll, they'll migrate, they'll leave the upland habitats uh, during these warm spring rainy nights and they'll migrate to these ephemeral or vernal pools. These are, these are ephemeral wetlands that lack fish. So they're fishless ponds and they may migrate in the hundreds overnight. And when I was doing my PhD research on this group, it was not uncommon to have my clipboard laying on the ground and see salamanders emerge from the soil, walk across my clipboard and head toward the, the wetland in order to breed that spring. So just I would, I would catch hundreds and hundreds of these things migrating to the wetland um, each and every night for a very short period because most of this migration really happened between a week or two. Okay, and that's when that mi migration happens. 
all members of this family have uh, an aquatic larval stage. So these females and males migrate to the breeding pond. Oftentimes they'll attach their eggs underneath the water under submergent vegetation, twigs and, and other vegetation. And it may take upwards of, you know, 15, 20 to 50 days for those eggs to hatch into aquatic larvae. And these aquatic larvae of mole salamanders are really important. And in fact, in these ephemeral ponds, they're oftentimes some of the top predators in that aquatic ecosystem, eating basically anything that they can fit in their mouth and sometimes including each other. And then it usually takes anywhere from two to five months for those larvae in those ephemeral ponds to metamorphose and transform and then uh, maintain a more terrestrial lifestyle again until the following spring when they migrate back to the ponds to breed. So that's a really quick overview of some of the basic breeding ecology, especially for the mole salamanders. And again, you can see some of the diversity. Some of our species are really chunky. Others are, tend to be a little bit more slender. Uh, but I would encourage you if you're interested in learning more, and, and I think Wendy, you might be able to put this in the link. Uh, there's, a, there's a book on the salamanders of Indiana, which goes into a lot more detail, not only on the ambistomatids that I shared with you, but some of the other salamander groupings that Spencer and Nick are going to share with you as well. So at this point, Nick, I'll turn it over to you. Nick, before you get started, I just want to remind everybody, if you have a question for any of our experts, um, I know some of you might hear just to stump Dr. Williams. Um, if you're here uh, and joining us, please uh, put your questions on Facebook in the comment section and they will answer them as they go along. I know we're going to be covering a lot of information today, so uh, please put your questions on Facebook and we'll get to them as we can. All right, so I'm, I'm going to talk about the, the aquatic salamanders. So my group is not as, uh, they're not as uh, related as, as the other couple of groups. These, these aquatic salamanders, they, they catch several different um, distantly related species, but, but the thing that ties them all together is these all require, they, they basically live their entire lives in the water. So it's, it's a little hard to tell with some of these pictures, but but that hellbender in the top left and the mud puppy in the top right, those are actually in streams on the bottom. Uh, the ampiuma on the bottom left is, is just kind of tucked in the mud, but they do spend most of their time in, in swamps. Uh, some of the, the really interesting things about these is since they do live in the water, they spend their whole time in the water, they, they've uh, evolved different types of, of respiratory strategies. So. So the mud puppy in the top right, it's, it's a little hard to see, but he's got, he's got some little gills that stick off the back of their head. So, so he's pretty adaptable. They, you'll find mud puppies in streams. You'll find them in ditches. You can find them in you know, 80 feet down in a pond or a, or a lake. They have them up in the Great Lakes. And those gills help them, help them extract oxygen from, from low, ox, uh, low oxygen systems. The, the same can be said for those lesser sirens in the bottom right. They're, they're a... Uh, it's rarely seen salamander that that you find really in uh, swampy areas. You find them in in canals and ditches, places you don't really spend much time. And they've got those those gills again that help them extract oxygen from from low oxygen water. But then we get to the hellbender, which is up there in the top left, and they don't have any gills. They they uh, spend their whole time in in basically clean rivers and streams, and they've they've evolved these big fluff or not fluffy, uh, these, these big flaps of skin uh, on off the sides of their bodies, uh, which actually got them one of their names, old lasagna sides, because they look like lasagna noodles. And they just, that just increases the surface area to extract water, basic, or to extract oxygen directly from the water. So, so you won't find Eastern hellbenders in in habitats that are really muddy or low oxygen, they have to have that, that clean water because they, they, that's, they don't have those gills to really increase their, their ability to extract oxygen. Now, one of the coolest things about this group of salamanders are, are these are all of these, all four of these salamanders here. These are the largest salamanders you're going to find in the US. Um, and then the, the Ampiuma and the Hellbender, they're, two of the largest salamanders in the world. So the, the hellbender, it's, they can get up to about five pounds. That's a really big hellbender. Ampiumas can get close to three feet long. Um, so, so these are really giant salamanders. And, and the, the, the stuff that Rod talked about, you know, they, 
max get maybe 10 inches, maybe 12, a really big tiger salamander. But, but these guys are just very large salamanders. So, so they are things that most people, usually when you think of the salamanders, you think of what you see in your yard, which are, you know, four inches, eight inches, but, but these guys are, are huge. Um, another cool thing about these is that since they live in the water, they've, they've evolved several different reproductive strategies. Uh, the, the hellbender, they breed more like fish. So they'll, uh, a male will pick a rock and the females will just lay the eggs out in the open under the rock. And, and the male just, uh, he just fertilizes the eggs sitting right there. There's no, there's no uh, interaction. There's not much interaction be between the sexes, but the other, the mud puppy, they, they're they more similar to the, the pond breeding species that Rod talked about. They they have the spermatophores. Actually, did you mention spermatophores, Rod? Oh, well, okay. So spermatophores, that basically it's a, it's a structure that, that the male uh, salamanders lay, uh, that it, it has the, the sperm packet in it, and then the female picks it up and, and uh, is fertilized. But completely different reproductive strategies between those two sirens. Uh, we don't really know. We don't have a good good feel for how they reproduce. Uh, they're since they're so cryptic, people don't really get to see them very often. And so it is it is a neat group of salamanders, but since they're not related, it's it's uh, difficult to talk about all of them at once. Um, and now I think we'll probably move to the to the terrestrial group uh, for Spencer to talk about. And and these guys are a, a little more co uh, coherent. Well, before I get into these salamanders, I, I was uh, listening to Rod's description of the Ambystoma, and it brought me back to the many years uh, that I worked on Ambystoma when they would come migrating in the nighttime. He described across his notebook, and uh, I just want to share with you a, a couple of items about that. And uh, first of all, if you if you ever get a chance to to experience an Ambystoma migration, do it. It's the most primal feeling I think you'll ever have in your in your in your whole existence on Earth. In fact, you'll think you're the only human being on the planet when you're watching these salamanders come and do their mating. As far as you're concerned, there aren't eight billion people on the planet. It's you and those salamanders, and it's a it's a great 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 uh, experience. Spencer, did you want to share one of the videos that you yeah, had? I was that that shows I was going to do that. Uh, my box for optimized video clip won't click, only the sound will. So I'm not too worried about that. But uh, let's see here. Uh, so marbled salamanders are interesting because they come to breed in their ponds in the fall around Labor Day. And I personally think I put a vote in that they're the most attractive salamander in uh, in Indiana. And they come to places, well, there's a, they're showing a different species there. Let me go ahead. So here's, they actually, most all the other Ambystoma lay their eggs in water, the kind of vernal ponds Rod described, but sometimes those ponds are dry around Labor Day. So here's that primal experience. Uh, that's uh, that's a male. The males have brighter coloration, and they come and hang out in the mud along the edge of a pond and look for females to uh, to mate. They'll actually just walk around on land, and you'll see the spermatophores that were described. And well, I think we might see some video later on. And then they actually lay their eggs on land, which is unique among the Ambystoma. So there's a a, a female there, and. So she might be laying under this leaf litter here where the pond isn't full and, and guarding those eggs until the pond fills up. And then there's the egg hatching as the water covers it up. And of course, she's long gone by that time. Then the other great primal thing, you'll feel like you've really lived life if you get to see either of these, but the spotted salamander comes in an uh, ra usually rainy nights, not clear nights like this. And they make their migration on toward over Rod's notebook and on their way. This is, I mean, it just feels like it's the essence of life here as they come sometimes over a little bit of snow like this. I've seen them on little snow patches. Uh, 
and they get closer to the pond, just making their ways. They have an amazing migration system that uh, not fully known exactly how it works, but probably using the magnetic field and memory, they're able to get back to the pond. And then once they get close, anybody who works in these ponds knows that the odors are a little on the rank side. <laughs> And, uh, and they probably use that as a key to make sure that they're doing it it right. And then they get into the water and they, they do this uh, Liebespiel dance like this. You can have uh, 50 of them here that looks like it's a half a dozen. I've seen as many as 50 and they cloud the water. There's those spermatophores they're laying. There's the sperm in the top of that spermatophore right there. So the female will come and place her hind end over that and clasp it off. And what I don't understand is if this dance is part of the mating ritual and it's usually pitch black where this is happening, how the female knows what sperm package she's getting, I don't know, maybe Rod knows, has, has learned that, but there, oh, there she is. Or that looks like another male. I'm a little confused on that, but we'll, now he must be laying that one. Oh, there's a, a big aggregation of them, but it's apparently this dance is meant to impress the uh, females. But again, without a headlamp or light, I don't know how they can tell. So what, what's interesting, what just happened there that Spencer was talking about is the males will actually cap other male sperm. So if, a, if, they, if a male encounters a spermatophore, he'll place his sperm on top of that sperm so that he's increasing his chances of the female picking up his uh, sperm so that he can sire more offspring than the, his competitor. Wow, maybe maybe the dance has nothing to do with quality. Maybe they're just confusing each other and laying on top of each other. It may have nothing. <laughs> oh, well, thanks for that. I, I'd forgotten about the capping. So thanks for reminding me uh, on that one. And let's see. Uh, so we'll, I'll stop my share. Whoop, I think I hit that. Did I shop, stop my, yeah, there we go. All right, so then the, the plethodon uh, salamanders are famous because they're lungless. They don't have any lungs and there are hypotheses as to how that happened. And I seem to recall that they relate to their origin perhaps in the Appalachian mountains that Rod was talking about. And they lived in such highly oxygenated water that lungs were not necessary. They could just take in all their oxygen through their skin and in fact, all, sal all salamanders take in a lot of oxygen through their skin, even if they have lungs and even if they have gills. But we have uh, the green salamander, which is found only in a few places in extreme southern Indiana in moist pockets in rocky cliffs, basically facing toward the Ohio River. Uh, we didn't even know they existed in Indiana till about 1995, I think. So that was a great find. The cave salamander then in, it is found mostly in uh, the karst regions with the caves and they uh, will breed in streams, nearby streams. So they'll spend time on land. But then we have the redback salamander, the zigzag salamander, they never go in water. One time I tossed one in a, a pond and it made a beeline to the shore very quickly. So it knew how to swim, that was kind of weird. Uh, but they, they don't want to be in water. They lay their eggs under, you know how sometimes big rotting logs seem to be moist, even in August or September? They'll, that's a place where they'll lay eggs in there. Or one time under some thick leaf litter, there was a Coke bottle buried and I picked up the bottle to throw it away and it had a bunch of redback salamander eggs underneath it. So I had to leave the trash for once out in the woods. Uh, or they'll do it under uh, or in small mammal tunnel, tunnels, like Rod mentioned. The zigzag salamander seems to live in a little bit drier places than the redback salamander, but otherwise is very similar. Let's go to the next one. And then the dusky salamander, which lives only in southeast Indiana, breeds in streams. So they'll, they'll be partly terrestrial up in the hills uh, adjacent to the streams. Then the southern two-line salamander, very similar. And I think oftentimes in even smaller streams and sometimes streams that dry up, uh, you know, at least they'll sur their larvae will survive in little pools isolated in a stream. But I think sometimes if the whole stream dries up, those larvae can get under moist rocks and wait it out till the next uh, 
rain. It's unbelievable. The long-tailed salamander found in similar places as the two-line salamander, and it lives up to its name. Just follow that tail. It's longer than the rest of the body. And it does pretty much, again, the same thing as the two-line salamander. You find them in streams and sometimes when they dry up. And then the ravine salamander, again, southeast Indiana, but totally on land. Never goes uh, under uh, in, in the water. I've only seen it one time in northern Kentucky, and it's it was near a stream, but uh, in a rock face. Four-toed salamander, fantastic uh, uh, salamander that has a beautiful white and black salt and pepper-like look underneath the belly, a constriction at the tail, so you can always tell that, but they tend to be more common in northern Indiana and in areas where there's what we call tussocks, sedges that grow out of a wetland or even logs out of a wetland with mosses, and they'll lay their eggs under those mosses, under the logs or tussocks, and then when the eggs hatch, the baby does a belly flop into the water the first thing in life. Well, there's that salt and pepper. I did there. They does a belly flop first thing. I guess it's like water birth in humans. And then the uh, red salamander, again, Southeast Asia, not very common in Indiana, uh, living in along the edges of streams. The slimy salamander, living up to its name 100%. I mean, this is another one of this, the biggest all terrestrial species that never goes in water. And uh, if you handle it, you will get some slime. And if you get some soil from the forest on your hand, it'll take a burlo pad to get it off. Uh, but anytime you handle any of these sa um, salamanders, you know, try to do it mostly under rainy conditions because they can rehydrate well if it's rainy. But if you're, if it's been dry for two weeks, try not to touch one of these things because you'll be kind of ripping their moisture off and they'll have trouble because they breathe through the moisture in their skin. All right, next. Uh, the stream side uh, salamander then. Yeah, well, oh, the, we're, we're done with the, yeah, okay. we, we're finished with the uh, the terrestrial stuff, but we just had a few extra photos in here if we, if we needed to get to them. Okay. So I guess, um, thanks for that update on all of the different species. I know some of them are way cool to look at and some of them are a little scary, like they look a little snake-like because you can't really see what you're looking at, um, especially if they're underwater or in mud. So I can imagine um, people being a little curious about that. So um, Dr. Corwright, you, you struck something in one of our viewers, Jonathan, he said, watching a female hellbender work her way upstream towards the den of a male is one of the most connected he's ever felt to their to our ancient past. So he, he you struck a nerve there for him. Um, <laughs> and uh, I wanted to, while we're on this subject, I know um, one of the big questions that a lot of people get is they're out and they're flipping over rocks and they're doing those kinds of things. And you talked about not touching them. Um, can I hurt them? Can, can Will they die if I touch them too much? Am I okay to pick it up? Like what, what are the rules when it comes to when I find a salamander under a rock or under a log and, and where should I put it if I do pick it up? Well, yeah, excellent, excellent question. And again, if it is really dry, I try not to ever touch them because when you do, they kind of have a mucus on their skin. And if, and if your hands are, it just literally rips it off of them. And that's what they breathe through. That'd be like somebody going in and taking the moist pockets out of your lungs, you know, like when you when it's cold day and you can't get any air, it, it's hard on them. But the other thing is be careful if you're looking under logs. I've seen people go and just rip the logs apart and don't even make any attempt to keep the, that'd be like a giant, the Jolly Green Giant coming to your house and taking the roof off your house to see if you're there and then leaving it in the yard. Now, I, could, why do we? Why would a single ecologist do that? Put the log back, but uh, but you got to do it gently and maybe let the salamander crawl back under the log because you might smash it. Another thing too is the leaf apron. You know, when you move the log, you disturb the leaf corridor along the log, and if you put the log back but leave a gaping hole there, that's going to allow the log to desiccate or dry out faster. So I always remind people, push the leaf apron back up against the log and just be careful and you'll be all right. While Nick, has, while Nick has those pictures up, one of the things I just wanted to add is, you know, as I mentioned, especially with the ambistomatid migrations, uh, when I was doing my PhD research some years ago, uh, Again, that usually occurred between a seven to 10, maybe a 12 day period. And then the, those adults would be gone again. Uh, 
but what they leave behind are these egg masses. And you can see that spotted that salamander, they're probably the, the most uh, readily seen by people because they're you know three to 500 eggs and they're about the size of a, a softball and they're heavily gelatinous. So if you put your hand under there, pick it up, they stay together like a little mass of a jelly softball with hundreds and hundreds of salamander embryo eggs in there and embryos developing within those eggs. But my point to that is if you visit these wetlands and walk along the edge, you may not see the salamanders themselves, but you can see what they leave behind, which are these really conspicuous egg masses. And spotted salamander egg masses are particularly unique in that oftentimes you'll see, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The Not fungus. Moth, algae. Algae, thank you. Algae growing inside that egg mass and that algae is producing oxygen, which helps the embryos remain oxygenated well. So that's, we think that that's a symbiotic relationship between the spotted salamanders and the algae attaching itself and embedding itself in the egg mass proper. And, this, and the spotted salamander egg mass is the firmest. So it's probably the hardest to get oxygen into. Something like the uh, Jefferson salamander has a much flimsier egg mass, kind of like something you might sneeze up in a bad winter cold. And that uh, is less protective. I mean, because caddisfly larvae can get in there and eat the embryos and get them out of there. Uh, newts can do that, but they can, they have a lot of trouble doing that with the spotted salamander egg masses. I, while we're on reproduction, I wanted to add one thing about certain ambistoma that are all female in, in Indiana. Up at the Indiana Dunes, we have some of these. And, and uh, I take my class out there every spring and they, it, they look to me to be the size of Jefferson salamanders. So one would think they're part of the Jefferson clan, but there's no male Jeffersons within like a hundred miles of here. So we have been looking for males in this pond for 20 years, and we haven't found a one of either blue spotted or Jefferson in this pond. So we have, we have no idea how this all female population is maintaining. The eggs are never very healthy. It's hard to even find eggs in them. And, uh, you know, maybe Rod's learned some more about how these how these all female lines go and how they persist when it seems like I have trouble finding eggs. And when I do find a little mass, they're 80 percent dead. But that that whole unisexual hybrid complex is really a bit of a black box uh, for lots of reasons. And, and I always teach this in my herpetology class. So it's one of the unique things about that hybrid complex is it can be diploid, it could be triploid, it could be tetraploid, it can even be quintiploid. So it can have up to five different sets of genomes from five different parental historic parental species and a different mitochondrial genome to boot. So they just have this really bizarre hybrid complex. And now they're not currently hybridizing. And today this hybrid hybridization occurred, we think about 5 million years ago. And, and the way this all female population works is the females, it's called gynogenesis. It's just the females need the sperm to initiate the cell division, but none of the male's genome from e any of those five parental species is actually incorporated into the progeny. It's a really bizarre system and we don't really know how it works uh, beyond that, but it's just a phenomenally interesting system. And I thought about working on that as a PhD student, but that would have been you know, 15 years ago. We still don't have those answers. So I'm glad I worked on sexual selection instead. Mm. And then moved on to hellbenders. Okay, just a reminder, if you have questions, I know we've said a lot of big words. Um, I think Rod could have just written a dictionary there. Um, but uh, if you have questions, please put those in the comments section. Um, we certainly, we love to get questions. And, and um, one of them that we get a lot um, is, are salamanders poisonous? So Rod, Nick, I'm gonna let you guys start that one off and uh, we'll go from there. But um, should I be concerned, um, A, that I'm going to get some kind of a disease or a poison or anything like that um, from these salamanders? So Nick, if you could, while, while I'm talking, if you could just back up real quick to go to the newts. And, and so, so Dr. Courtright has actually touched on this a little bit. So that same mucus layer that he mentioned allows for these salamanders to respire through their skin also has glands in their skin, which will produce some alkaloid type toxins that are that are somewhat uh, 
they're more of an irritant. So if you were to handle one of these salamanders or, or aggravate them, oftentimes you'll see a milky substance, especially on like tiger salamanders or spotted salamanders and Jefferson salamanders, you'll see a milky substance come up on their tail. And if you were to touch that milky substance and then rub your eye, it would be really irritating. Or if you you know, put your finger near your nose because oftentimes you're out in rainy nights and your nose has water dripping on it and you wipe your nose and your nose will start to burn and your nose will start to tingle. Uh, and you never put your fingers in your mouth when you're handling salamanders ever. So I don't know what that's like and I would strongly not recommend it, but it will cause irritation. And there are some species like the Eastern newt, which are even more toxic. And, and you can see oftentimes animals that, are, that, that do have a lot of toxins in their skin and are, are poisonous will have really bright coloration, which is an advertisement that their skin has some of these toxins so that predators and people will avoid touching them so that they don't uh, become uh, part of that, that toxic experience. And the Eastern Newt is obviously a, a bright orange. And, and here we have the red F stage, which is the, the terrestrial stage of our Eastern Newt. And it's, it, it's got a really powerful tetrodotoxin, which is again, a, a toxin that's secreted through glands that have really granular skin. And if I used to have some, some pet amphibians back in the day, and I, I once observed uh, American bullfrog eat an Eastern newt red eft, and the bullfrog immediately took both front feet and pulled the, the red eft out of its mouth and, and spit it out immediately because it was so distasteful because of those tetrodotoxins that that Eastern newt was secreting. So. So there, I would say that the toxins that we have in our Indiana salamanders serve as a mild irritant to your mucosal linings of the eyes, the nose, and the mouth and throat. Now there are some out west and some, and some other amphibians in particular that are really toxic, but in Indiana, a mild irritant. Nick, I don't know if you have anything you wanna add. Well, I'll add one thing about New England colleges. I, I, I've talked with people who went to colleges in New England and they report that, that certain fraternities will have salamander eating parties. And they would normally go out and get a, a woodland, like a redback salamander. And I, I asked these people to can describe this vulgarity. They described it, it all seemed true. But there's legend that some one time the fraternity sent the pledges out to get the salamanders and they came back with these Fs. And either somebody died or was on the verge of death, and that that part might be legend. I didn't actually talk to someone on that one, but there, there are uh, reports of that sort of behavior in the Pacific Northwest, where you have um, the rough skin newts, and and people have consumed rough skin newts in the Pacific Northwest, and it did result in some mortality, human mortality. Hmm. But the entire salamander was ingested. Oh. So basically like a really bad jalapeno pepper incident. Like we, we really don't want that, you know, kind of that, oh my gosh, I touched my eyeballs and I need to go wash them out kind of thing is what we're talking about. Unless you, you know, go beyond just touching it. Um, so anything else we want to add before we move on to some of the threats to these amazing amphibians? Uh, we could go on to the threats. Okay. Yeah, so Nick something. Oh, Nick has something. Oh, well, I was, yeah, with, with the threats. Uh, so, so amphibians are just as a whole, one of the most endangered group of animals in the world. Um, they are given that they need the, the constant moisture, the uh, climate change is really, is really affecting them. Uh, but there are some, some smaller scale threats, uh, smaller scale, uh, that that affect them more locally. And, you know, one of those things is, is habitat loss. So especially with, with, you know, this, the ambistomatid species that Rod, Rod talked about, and a lot of these uh, wetland and stream species uh, in Indiana, for instance, you know, we've lost since, since settlement, it's estimated that Indiana has lost about 85% of its wetlands. And so, so that is 85% of the habitat for these, you know, these spotted salamanders and the, and the amphiumas and the, you know, the sirens that, that's just gone. So, so if, I mean, imagine reducing all the habitat for, or for a group of species by 85% and, and there's not a lot left. And there, and, you know, there's, there's currently legislation looking at, 
that further reduce uh, potentially harming, uh, you know, wetland conservation. So th there are a lot of issues surrounding um, amphibian conservation with as, as far as wetland are concerned. Uh, you know, these these stream species, so the, the hellbender and, and a lot of the, you know, some of the mud puppies, since they do spend their entire lives in water, they're very susceptible to, to water quality degradation. So, so any pollution that gets into, you know, into the river, you know, since they spend all their time in there, they absorb that through their skin. And, and that's really cause for the hellbender. Uh, for instance, it's, it's only found in one river in Indiana now, and in that river, it's, it's almost gone. Uh, and that is primarily due to various forms of, of water quality degradation, um, you know, sediment, sediment inputs and, and just uh, general poor water quality chemicals. Um, and the terrestrial species are maybe, you know, the, the forested species, they're maybe a little less threatened in Indiana, uh, just because we, we do have a lot of, of public lands and and you know people like to keep the forest on their property, uh, but but the wetland, especially the wetland species, uh, are very subject to to habitat loss. And then you know there's other things like Rod, Rod's going to talk about disease, and that's that's kind of a big existential threat throughout the throughout the country and the world. So with respect to disease, there's there's two or three things that are sort of the, the, the big two or three that I want to mention. So the, the first is, is chytrid, and you've probably heard about chytrid if you follow any of the natural resource media uh, at, at all. And that's that's a disease that was really first described in Central America, and it really hit uh, a lot of our frogs and toads in Central America. And you could actually track uh, the spread of that disease by about 100 kilometers a year as it moved through portions of Central America. And un undoubtedly, we have chytrid in Indiana. We, we there's several colleagues in the state that have, have done work on that particular disease, and there's there's a lot of variation in the sensitivity of our various amphibians in general to, to chytrid. Some species are highly sensitive to it, and other species tend to have it, but perhaps not be might not may not manifest into a full fledged disease state. But but chytrid is very common, and a really simple solution that we want to encourage people is, you know, if you're going to go out and, and look for amphibians or reptiles, and we just do encourage you to get out and enjoy and appreciate nature, right? These are fantastic animals, and you can really learn a lot. And again, you can have that connection that Spencer really talked about earlier, because that connection is, once you see it, you're going to want to go back and see it again. But it is important if you're visiting these wetlands, some of these diseases like chytrid can be spread by us. So if you go into a wetland, uh, that has a, a high level of chytrid in the system and then you leave and then you go immediately to another wetland, you know, 10 miles away that does not have chytrid and you still have those chytrid spores on your on your boots or on your waders and you go out into that wetland, you can now introduce that particular disease in that wetland. So if you're moving between wetlands, it is important to try to, to clean your gear and you can either, you know, spray it with a really dilute uh, solution of bleach or for chytrid, you could just lay your waders and boots out to dry. And as long as they're completely dry for three or four hours, it will kill those chytrid spores and your, and your probability of spreading that disease goes down substantially. And so uh, then you can go and enjoy these wetlands from, from place to place. Another disease is ranavirus that some of our species also have. And I've done a little bit of work in consultation with uh, a disease ecologist at the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources, Dr. Jason Hooverman, who is our ranavirus expert. And again, the susceptibility is highly variable across species. And what's interesting about ranavirus is that it's not only found in our amphibians, but can also be found in our reptiles too. Okay, so the, the same sort of precautions you wanna use if you're sampling wetlands and sampling forests with chytrid, you wanna sort of follow those same sort of safety procedures with ranavirus as well. And the third disease that's not presently found in the United States is, is b sal which is similar uh, to, to chytrid in some respects, uh, but it's been devastating in other parts of the, of the world. And I know the US has really tried hard to set up some surveillance programs to make sure that we don't let b cell enter the United States because it's had, had devastating effects on amphibians and other parts of the world. And we wanna to try to minimize the chance and likelihood that we bring that into the United States because we, we don't know we don't, we don't want it to be devastating to our amphibians, as Nick already mentioned, that are already struggling in certain parts of the regions for some of the reasons that he talked about and some of the reasons that Spencer's probably gonna follow up with. So Spencer and Nick, feel free to add to the disease as well. 
the one thing I'll add is on the ranavirus, uh, in the 80s and 90s, when it, when these diseases were not well known, you know, you, you could have die-offs and not know if you're a, not an epidemiologist like I'm not, you wouldn't know what was going on. But in my talking with Jason and I need to work more with him on some samples in that, you know, it, at least in uh, Brown County there, they, they had a lot of, uh, I mean, virtually every pond had, I think, had the ranavirus. Now it would only erupt when uh, the wood frog population got super dense, then you know they might lay as many as 400 egg masses in a pond about 300 square meters. That's a lot of wood frog egg mass. And I could almost get to the point where I would predict, oh, they're gonna all die. And so the wood frog tadpoles would die 100%. Now the ambistema, like the Jefferson and, and spotted, it seemed not to be related to density but it would be more like one third to half the salamanders would get it and die from it. But then once the wood frog population after two or three years of this tadpole die off, once the adults got down to like 140 or 80 or something like that in a pond, then the tadpoles were healthy again for a few years. So I, I saw several cycles with the wood frogs, but I, I couldn't correlate any cycling with the salamanders. So that hits on what Rod was talking about uh, on the, the you know, different species are affected differently by these, by these things. And we, we have learned a lot more about disease, disease, disease susceptibility, disease transmission, especially in the last decade or so because of molecular tools. Uh, historically, we had to rely on the animals, you know, showing effects of that disease. And then you had to do histopathology, you, had to, you know, had to look at the skin and, and to make sure that that was the cause of death. But now we have these re really rapid molecular techniques that says, yes, this animal has it. So our, our detection of this, of the disease and how it spreads is much well more well known now than it was even just a decade ago because of molecular genetics. And then can I ask you all a question then related to this? So we're, we know that in the in the Central and South America chytrid problem, you know, we know that's a really severe one. Uh, but in general, to these amphibian diseases, you know, there could be multiple things going on. The pathogen could be evolving more virulence. There could be some kind of stressors making the amphibians uh, less able to fend them off, or they could be novel. Can, can you address? Can you all address? I'm not very knowledgeable on that. Uh, the answer is yes. To all three? <laughs> so, for, for example, we, we do know that we'll use hellbenders, for example. Uh, we do know that, that hellbenders uh, have been shown to, to have chytrid on their skin, but they're not showing chytridomycosis, which is a disease state of, of chytrid. But if you stress hellbenders, if you were to elevate the water temperature or, or decrease the water quality, they could start showing disease symptoms, right? Because you're 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 lowering the immuno system, immuno um, compromise. You're immunocompromising the hellbenders essentially, weakening their immune system, which allows the diseases that are currently on there to manifest in a much greater way. So that certainly does happen, okay. and we know with what's going on with global pandemics, how how quickly viruses can mutate and change strain, and and the virulence can can be associated with that as well. So. We know those two things are going on, uh, and, and again, there, there could be other pathogens that we just don't have assays, molecular assays for, to determine whether they're here or not. They could be here, we just haven't found a way to detect them effectively yet. So that's why I say yes, I think it's probably some combination of all the things that you just brought up. So Rod, we got super technical there. Um, let's bring it back a little bit for, um, we have a really great question, and I think um, kind of is a good way for us to kind of wrap up a little bit, um, is how do I even get started with herping, as they as you all call it? Um, you know, do I need to read some books? Um, are there places I should be going? I guess kind of give us the the rundown. Um, our question comes in um, from a teacher, and she she says I get a lot of questions at um, about herpetofauna at state parks. How would you answer the question of getting started in herping? Because a lot of people just want to jump in and start flipping over rocks. And that helps a lot. But I think an old fashioned book, oh, that's backwards there, uh, by Sherman Mitten on the amphibians and reptiles of Indiana is great. In the 1980s, when I was learning things, I would just read his notes and then I'd go out in the field and 
it was like I'd experienced it already. And a lot of his natural history notes are from the 1930s, 40s, 50s, but that hasn't been changing. <laughs> so you can learn a lot about amphibians just from that and the other source that Rod mentioned. So Wendy, you might be able to put Sherman Minton's um, book in the in the chat now or later. But we also we have a, a new public relatively new publication called Enjoying and Appreciating Amphibians and Reptiles, uh, which is a great resource to, to get you started. But a couple of things. One is is as as Spencer mentioned, you know, do do a little bit of reading, but before you go out, so that you you know where to look, and more importantly, you know how to look without you know damaging the habitat or certainly causing harm to the animals themselves. But the way I learned best was to go with someone who knew. And so I would watch them and learn from them. And, and there are amphibian and reptile enthusiasts all throughout the state that I think would be delighted to take someone out that is interested in getting into uh, experiencing amphibians or reptiles because it's relatively inexpensive, right? As long as you have the habitat nearby and you spend a little bit of time, really, really all you need is a good pair of field boots and a headlamp and you're good to go and maybe a field guide, right? And then beyond that is just experience. And the more you go out, the more educated you'll become. And, uh, but I will warn you, it becomes quite addictive and it comes, becomes quite a passion for at least the three people that are on this call for sure. Yeah, yeah and, and Indiana does have, it has the, the Hoosier Herpetological Society, which is, is a group of, of, at least many of them are herpers and they are, they're a they're a good group and and a lot of them are willing to take people out and and show them new places i mean they'll 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 do basically what rod said they'll show you the ropes and and uh help you kind of get your feet wet and literally and uh, hmm. um, show you what you need to do and and since amphibians like bad weather uh be willing to go out in bad weather you know th these are not butterfly watching conditions for amphibians, many times you got to go on that, uh, you know, you, you, you become a weather, you could tell how cold has it been. And then all of a sudden this 58 degree rainy night is coming. Is it going to be rainy in the, in the late afternoon into the night or is it going to be more, more like dawn? You start thinking like these amphibians and, and the only way to get it right is to go out and do it. And, that, and don't shy away from bad weather, but be safe. I mean, lightning and all that, you want to be safe, but uh, uh, you, you can't, it's not going to be a walk in the park weather-wise in most cases. So I shouldn't be concerned if I start seeing as the weather warms up here a little bit, um, some of that scurrying back and forth between my thawing pond and, and the land and things like that. Um, I know a lot of people are probably concerned that it's a little cold for them to survive, but they know what they can do, right? So, some of them know what they can do. We, I actually, my uncle just sent me a picture a couple of days ago of a spotted salamander dead on the snow that had, uh, he came out, I guess, you know, in about eight inches of snow and, and his impression was ac actually melted down into the snow where he had, he had froze. He was just warm enough to melt a little impression down there. But, mm. but for the most part, they are, they are better at, at avoiding what will kill them than, than that and poor guy. If they do have a bad go of it, the fact that most of them, especially the salamanders, live for several years. So if they lose a year class, like one, one pond uh, I, I was studying, the Jeffersons all came in, in a really heavy breeding migration, and then it got iced over for two weeks. And when I came back and it had thawed, there were like 200 dead hot dogs in the pond. They, they couldn't break through the ice, and they ran out of oxygen under, under there. But that was one well that was that were the adults so that's multiple year classes but the the juveniles from previous years didn't participate in that breeding yet so you know i hardly noticed a drop down the worry with climate change is if if extreme events happen more frequently like a freeze and then an early drought in the summer then you lose that adult class and then you lose that year's juvenile class if these things happen more frequently they, you know, there, there, there could be problems for amphibians, uh, but it's not something that a climate scientist can predict in in any reasonable time frame because these things play out over decades. But for now, I guess Rod, let's just wrap up on a positive note here. There's some great research going on out there that you're doing, that Nick's doing, that Spencer's doing, and and your colleagues across the country 
to not only help prevent or mitigate any damage in these type of incidents, but um, just continue to get to know um, these species and how we can help them um, as humans. Do you want to talk a little bit about that before we um, jump sure. off? As we wrap up, you know, we'll sort of wrap up with a with a positive conserv conservation message. Now, one of the things we really haven't talked about when we sort of went through that list of some of these really amazing salamanders that we have in Indiana is that some of them, as amazing as they can be, are, are threatened or endangered in the state, meaning their, their populations are really, really low in number. And so we have to step in and in, in an intervention to try to make sure that we don't they don't disappear from the Hoosier uh, Hoosier Hoosier state. And one of those species is the eastern hellbender, the, the largest salamander that we have in the state. And you know, Nick and myself and, and the students in my lab, we've been working on with hellbenders since about 2008. And we're at the point now where we've been going out and, and collecting eggs from the wild. We bring the eggs into captivity. We hatch those eggs. We actually work with four, four uh, zoos across Indiana that are also now helping rear hellbender eggs. And we'll those eggs hatch in captivity, will rear those larvae for up to four years so that they get about 12 inches long where they're, they can elude most of the aquatic predators like fish and crayfish. And then we'll reintroduce those hellbenders back into the river uh, where they originated from or where we want to repopulate them. And it gives them a really jump, a head start as it were on life. Uh, and, and so, you know, in the years we've, we've what, how many have we released, Nick? A couple of hundred uh, up to this point, but we're in the next three or four years, we'll probably have released over a thousand hellbenders back into Indiana waters. And so we're working really hard to restore that really ancient amphibian to our landscape. And so my lab here at Purdue, we have a big facility that Shelby Royal uh, manages and, and takes care of our hellbender husbandry. And Nick is, is heads up our, our, our research in Southern Indiana along the Blue River. Nick, I'll let you talk about some of the work that you're doing. Yeah, and uh, you know, we've, we've been doing these releases over the last several years and, and we didn't want to just release hellbenders. We wanted to learn something while we were doing it. And so one of the things we've been doing is, is in captivity, uh, we've, we've been rearing hellbenders in, in different uh, environmental conditions and then trying to compare when you release them, compare the survival between the ones that were reared in say, for instance, uh, like a flowing stream inside versus those that were just raised in a still aquarium. And so we've, we've been uh, radio tracking all these hellbenders and, and comparing their survival and we're going to to do another batch this summer and then we'll finish that up next year and we'll have a nice big set of data to to help inform future releases on you know what can we do to to maximize our our hellbender potential versus just you know throwing them in aquaria and, and letting them loose and and wishing for the best and spencer do you have uh you have any anything well my i'll go down a slightly different road and that is that for salamanders or amphibians in general, if we have clusters of wetlands in an area, that is what Mother Nature intended in the first place when she invented Indiana. <laughs> and, and, and that's how she meant wetlands to be, in clusters. And that helps amphibians to have clusters. You'll get greater diversity because each wetland will be a little bit different. And, and what, what, uh, the, the study I did the longest time looked at a very common frog in Indiana, the great tree frog. And it, you know, most people would not worry about it at all because it's so common in some places. But in deep woods with small ponds, it, it's not optimal habitat because the tadpoles like warmer water, but it's shady. And so they don't, the tadpoles don't grow very fast and they can't beat past the predators very well. But yet they persist in, say, an area of Brown County over 28 wetlands because every year there's one or two or three wetlands where the predators, like the salamanders, had one of those die-offs I just mentioned. And the tree frogs would recruit from that pond, even though it's suboptimal for them. And so that, that way, over a 25-year period, which pond in what years did well is, a, is, is kind of semi-random. But if you have the cluster of wetlands, you maintain all the species. And it's not just the great tree frog, it's other ones as well. And that's what has the legislation that's going through worrying me because it lets people decide they can destroy all their wetlands if they want, uh, the way I understand it. And so one landowner might have a couple of wetlands, this person might have six, but if this person fills them all in, then those two are more isolated. I don't, I, I, I it seems weird. 
that we would allow that to happen, but let's see, we'll see. Well, I hope um, all of you have learned as much as I have about salamanders. I know we love our hellbenders and um, I put some things in the comment section there on Facebook. Um, thanks, shout out to Shelby. If you wanna uh, jump over and join the Help the Hellbender uh, Facebook page, they have their own page and are constantly putting updates from the lab and everything like that. So you can keep up with what we're doing with our hellbenders. Um, we have several videos on our YouTube page um, regarding hellbender hides and where you might find them and, and how, and some of our hellbender releases like Rod talked about. Um, and also uh, some of our partners, we've done some of these Ask the Expert sessions with Mesker Park Zoo. Um, we've also done them with the wilds and also you can take a tour of our hellbender facility here on campus at Purdue. So um, I encourage you to go to our, our um, YouTube page and check that out. Um, I'll also put the com um, those in our comment section as well. And if you have questions about hellbenders or other salamanders, um, you can reach out to Rod or Nick or Dr. Courtright, and uh, they would be happy to talk to you offline about that as well. So if you are watching this in archive, um, please uh, feel free to leave your questions in the comments section and we will get back to you um, after the fact. Uh, we certainly don't want to discourage questions um, if you have them. So go ahead and, and jump on over um, and ask us those. Um, want to encourage you uh, to join us for our next Ask the Expert, which will be on March the 4th. Uh, we'll be talking about aquaculture with Amy Schombach and Bob Rohde from our aquaculture programs here at Purdue. And we hope you will join us then. Um, so for now, um, that's it from Hellbender Land. Um, thank you, Rod. Thank you, Nick. And thank you, Spencer. Um, and again, uh, we hope you'll join us on March 4th. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Finding salamanders. Enjoy the, enjoy the spring. <laughs> Bye.